Welcome everybody. I am Anne from Stand.Earth. You are in the right place for the webinar, Race and the Election, What Changes in U.S. Demographics Could Mean for Progressive Power. We are very honored to have Steve Phillips with us today. He's the best-selling author of Brown is the New White, How the Demographic Revolution Has Created a New American Majority. He's also a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress and the founder of Democracy in Color. Welcome, Steve. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. And facilitating today is our executive director at Stand.Earth, Todd Paglia. Thank you, Todd. Absolutely. All right, with that, I'm going to close out my webcam and let Todd take it away. Thanks, Anne. And Steve, thanks again for being here. Um, the new book, which has been a New York Times bestseller, uh, Brown is the New White, How the Demographic Revolution has Created a New American Majority. Uh, for those of you out there uh, who have not read the book yet, um, it's an incredible book. It's not just about data and demographic changes. It is really rich in the story of America and what's happened over the last you know, 400 plus years to deliver us to this moment. Um, and Steve, just for folks who haven't read this, uh, this book, can you just start us off with what is the new American progressive majority, what is it, who are they, um, and when did you begin focusing on this? Yeah, so um, thanks for, for inviting me and everyone else for taking time to be part of the conversation. Um, so I come up the, I mean, I'm quite literally a child of the civil rights movement. I mean, I was uh, uh, born in 1964, one of my first uh, memories of seeing Martin Luther King when he came to Cleveland when I was three years old. Uh, my family desegregated our neighborhood in Cleveland Heights, um, Ohio, and um, read all the biographies of Martin Luther King when I was in the elementary school library when I was growing up. So I've had that milieu all along, and I was also very interested in politics my whole life. Um, my next-door neighbor ran for state legislature when I was like eight years old. So I've always been very drawn to, to politics and had the civil rights orientation. So, and a lot of that for me began to manifest in the 80s during the uh, uh, 84 and 88 Jesse Jackson for President campaigns and the Rainbow Coalition, this concept of the old minorities coming together comprising a new majority. So that's really been, I think, a lot of ways my life's work has been building the small R rainbow all these years. And so I have always believed that people of color and progressive whites are a strong political force within the, within the country and within the, the world, frankly. And so when Obama ran in 06 and 07 and began to really put himself out there, I was very drawn to the campaign, was really very hopeful about it because I had seen what was possible through the Rainbow Coalition pieces when you have a mobilized, enthusiastic community of color linked to progressive whites, what that could mean. And so when he won, and then even more importantly, when he won re-election, that said to me and showed me that there was this transforma transformational point within the country's politics, mm -hmm. and that it was not just a question of a single individual being elected, and it was this historic moment in terms of electing the first African-American president, but was particularly uh, politically significant is that it marked the transformation at an inflection point in terms of elections and who actually could be elected and what the coalition that could uh, uh, elect people with was. And so, particularly in Obama's re-election, where he got five million fewer white votes than he got in 2008, yet still won re-election um, by, over, by over four million votes. So that, to me, showed politically, mathematically, that there is this majority, which is large numbers of people of color, a high percentage of people of color population, plus the, what I call the meaningful minority of, of whites who consistently vote progressive. He got 39%. Uh, in 2012, that's what I call the new American majority. And I use the Obama metrics from 2012, some of our best chances to quantify who that is, how many people it is. And so 80.5% 80 of voters of color, 39% of white vote, that was Obama's winning coalition. And if you take those percentages and you apply them to the entire uh, eligible voter population in the country, that's 51% of the, of the entire country's voting population. So that's what I mean by new American majority um, 
80% of people of color, 39-ish percent of whites, and historically, every presidential election since 76, the average is 40% of whites who vote for the Democrat. Um, that's a majority, and it's a progressive majority. And so we this, it was just part of the, much of the impetus for my book is both that too many people in political campaigns don't appreciate that this marked an inflection point in terms of the electorate. And they wrote it off as, well, we had this singularly gifted, uh, charismatic leader, which we'll never have again. Uh, but no, it's showing that in terms of who actually votes, that if we double down on, invest in, organize, mobilize the communities of color and progressive whites around a progressive agenda, that we can and should be winning elections. And so that was the premise, and that was the underlying principles of putting the book together. And it's, it seems like there's been a little bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy around this idea that President Obama, as gifted and special as he is, there's a sort of sense of his uniqueness is why he won. And then the sort of forgetting of this progressive majority that led to the loss of Congress. I mean, it feels like that has sort of cemented in some ways, which you're beginning to break open, this idea that that progressive majority even exists because we keep losing um, in Congress. So, so what, what, why did that happen? What do, you, what do you see as the central sort of mistake from a historic win to a series of losses in Congress? Yeah, so that's actually a very important point. I actually wound up getting into a big thing on Twitter the other day about it. Um, this political science professor from uh, Michigan who sent me a 37-page paper, which was uh, intellectually flawed in terms of its presence. Um, so a lot of people assume, and that's what this paper was arguing, and not even just that guy, it really is the conclusion that people, even uh, David Axelrod put in his book, and even Chuck Schumer was saying in 2014, the premise is that the electorate was static, and that the voters elected Obama, then the Democrats overreached on health care, and then the voters re, uh, turned on the Democrats and voted them out. And that is the dominant narrative, which persists, sadly, to this day. Yet it's not mathematically correct, and it's not supported by the actual evidence of what happened. So in any election, any off-year election, there is some level of drop-off of uh, from the presidential year, in terms of what the turnout is going to be. So the 2010 drop-off, the Republican drop-off was 7 million votes. Democratic drop-off was 26 million votes. That's why we lost the House, and then there was a similarly dramatic drop-off in 2014. So it wasn't that um, there was this shift against the voters, uh, against the, the Democrats by the uh, static electorate. It's that those people who were against the Democrats kept voting, and those people who were more progressive um, didn't come out. And so that's the lesson, that is if we really want to preserve and continue gains in non-presidential years, we've got to work on getting people out to vote to the polls. So a lot of that has to do with organization, a lot of that has to do with um, uh, reforms in terms of the um, uh, structurally, online voter registration, um, making it easier for people to participate and get out to the polls, same day voting, things like that, as well as inspiring candidates and issues. All of that needs to be built into the operation so that we could have um, more um, greater participation in those off years. That's the key lesson, and I think it's a critical lesson heading towards 2018. Yeah, and, and Steve, you, you got into a bit of detail in the book, which I, I thought was very interesting, um, as far as how healthcare reform and how immigration reform sort of played into what ended up being a kind of abandonment of this progressive majority. So it's, you know, there's online voting, there's rep voter registration, there's a lot of factors, but even how uh, the administration and Congress played those big ticket legislative battles kind of went in the wrong direction in a lot of ways. Can you talk about that a little bit? That, and how that impacted turnout in all of those Democrats staying home? Uh, yeah, so the problem, I thought, was significantly that, um, um, again, people didn't come out to vote. And so that was the issue, and that was the challenge, is that why don't um, our folks 
turn out. And there was not provided to people, um, actually I'm going to make a little adjustment logistically here. I'm at my house and it's going to get a little bit present. I move my location, but I'm still going to be part of this. Mm -hmm. You'll just see me moving around a little bit. So, um, hold on one second. Um, I, Whoa. <clears throat> Actually, I'll just go here. So, um, in terms of the of that piece of the election, that people in 2010 and 2014 did not realize and did not appreciate that there were important things taking place in the election that year, and that um, there was a reason to come out. So everybody came out. They supported Obama. They supported what his agenda was. Um, but they didn't realize that in 2010, the things he was fighting for in terms of health care, in terms of immigration reform, the issues that were, which were important to the new American majority were at risk and were going to be rolled back and were going to be attacked um, in that year. And so that was the problem that we faced um, in that time period. And so there's this um, downward spiral is that if your conclusion that the reason that we lost, which is what you know Schumer and Oxford and others were saying, is because we were too liberal and too progressive, then you're just going to get even less progressive. But mm -hmm. what actually happened was that we were not making the argument to progressive people around what, what, why it was important and why it was worthwhile um, to come out. And so it's actually the opposite of what the conventional wisdom is around what we should be doing and what we should have been doing at that time. Yeah. Yeah, and this is, this is a big theme of what you have found in sort of working on and investigating this issue of writing this book, is, which is fascinating and I think played out in exactly the example we're talking about right now. But this sort of, whether you end up calling it soccer moms or white working class or ex-urban or, you know, there's a variety of labels that you mentioned for this sort of shrinking white swing voter um, and how it sounds like, you know, this is still a, an incredible obsession, despite the presence of this progressive majority, of like focusing in on this, you know, increasingly small white swing vote segment. Um, how, how do you think that happened, and why does it keep happening? What, what's the deal? Yeah, and unfortunately it continues to happen to this day, right? Even, you know, I think in many ways even the, you know, the Clinton campaign gets these issues more than um, some of the folks who even, I think, ran um, Obama's campaign, but still not sufficiently, right? And so you hear in recent days that, you know, the Clinton campaign is going to contest um, Arizona, but the monetary expression of that is going to put $2 million in the TV ads. And the, point of TV ads is persuasion to change the mind of the likely voters, which tended to be a wider uh, sector of the pool. Some early priorities USA, the super PAC is going to go into Georgia, they're going to go into Georgia with TV ads. Whereas those, you know, two million in Arizona, a million in Georgia, that amount of that money could go towards hiring staff people to do uh, phone banking and door knocking and identifying and getting people to the polls. Which is, and African Americans in Georgia and Latinos in um, Arizona, that's the way to actually win the election. So um, I think at a certain level, it's a combination. I mean, that what you're asking is the single most common question I've gotten this entire year as I've gone across the country is why does this persist? Um, part of it, I think, frankly, is just laziness, and that mm -hmm. it's much easier for a consultant to think up a you know, seemingly brilliant ad and then put it on the computer and then just shoot it out to uh, lots of people. It's a much easier proposition than to hire dozens or hundreds of people, organize a canvassing operation, track all of that data. It's very labor intensive and frankly less profitable um, to the consultants. So that I think is a big part of it. And then the other part we were talking about before is so I just don't think that people have really um, come to terms with the electoral significance of the arrival of the Obama coalition as a significant and ongoing force within elections. And they still think that the most important voters are those likely voters uh, who tend to be the swing voters that they, that they uh, consistently go after. Yeah. Yeah, well, <clears throat> it does, th this thinking does continue to persist, which with some of the examples that you gave make it all the more sort of galling that this thinking persists. 
One of the examples that you provide is California, the launching place of Nixon and Reagan, and that's you know, an example of where the new progressive majority in a lot of ways has taken control. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because that's as far as a microcosm um, and a very large one, how it's already worked. So what happened there? What's different there and why is some of the thinking that we're seeing persist nationally? What, what reversed it in California? Right, and that we've made a lot of progress in California, but there's still uh, um, ways to go, right, is that California is actually now um, ma uh, mathematically the majority of all eligible voters are people of color. So, you know, technically, yes, you don't need any voters to actually win an election, in Cal a white voter to win an election, you know, but fortunately, you know, roughly more than a third are progressive, mm. but people still persist in terms of trying to chase the moderate conservative white swing voter. But how we got to this point, it is a um, model for the country, an example from the countries, um, for the country, what we're going for, particularly now with this year with Trump and the whole backlash and the whole, um, um, uh, resentment of the communities of color. There's a great book called Preserving Privilege by uh, Professor Jewel Gibbs, who um, documented what happened in California in the early 90s. And there were these ballot measures, and Governor Pete Wilson ran on an anti-immigration platform. Um, he was the first border, you know, build a wall person. Um, then there was the anti-bilingual education ballot measure, anti-affirmative action, anti um, it was a, the whole three strikes measure came forward. So all of these ballot measures and all this public policy that was driving politics in the early 90s in California was rooted in a reaction against and uh, fear of the changing demographics of the state. And so what happened is particularly after the anti-immigration measure and people since 94 piece, Latinos began to register and naturalize in large numbers and became a much bigger proportion of the electorate within the state of California. And so from that time period, really since 1998, with the exception of a, a movie star actor who people thought they were electing a character from a movie rather than an actual person, there's a Schwarzenegger, <clears throat> California has elected no Republicans statewide. And because the electorate has changed so dramatically over that time period, and what that's enabled in terms of uh, its uh, potential that's opened up is to pass a much more progressive policy agenda. So on the democracy front, we have been able to pass online registration, same day voter registration. After we pass online voter registration, the six weeks after that, 800,000 people registered to vote. And so just opening up and expanding into now uh, Secretary of State Padilla is advancing automatic registration. So if you're in the DMV records, then you're automatically put on the voting rolls. And so it upends the notion around you have to do all this work to get somebody on the rolls to vote. And as, as organizers, it takes out, it eliminates that hurdle of that's time, labor, and money to be able to have to get folks on the rolls. Right. To be able to do that, another example is in the public and the uh, environmental realm. Um, when you we had uh, um, Kevin DeLeon, President of the State Senate, and then Groups like uh, Green for All um, um, and Greenlining, you know, Vietnam Vien Trung is uh, one of the leaders of uh, Green for All now, is a big advocate for this work, this whole polluter pays notion. And so California has now created legislation which requires polluters to pay money into a fund which then goes to disadvantaged communities. And so we're now moving, um, you know, close to half a billion dollars a year directly into disadvantaged communities uh, and f those funds coming from the uh, uh, greenhouse gases and the polluters and that, and that whole sector of the population. And that could be a model for the whole country. And so those things became possible as the electorate changed and as the electorate put new people in power. And so I think that's a glimpse of what's put, what the power and the potential is. Um, when you have, and then this year as well, right? So there's a, the whole fight for 15 minimum wage piece. Yeah. The governor did not want to embrace that as legislation, but the nurses union and others got it qualified for the ballot. And when they did, 
um, he saw he knew that he could count that the electorate was would vote for it, and so then that led him to embrace legislation to move it forward. So a whole progressive era of public policy is now possible because of the political composition of the demographics of the electorate. Yeah, yeah, and you know when we talk about you know major leading edge progressive areas, we don't often think of Texas. Uh, and that's one of the states that you, you write about that actually sort of remarkably could follow what's happened in California. Can you talk a little bit about both the numbers and, and what you think is possible in a state that many of us think is so conservative like Texas, um, but may not be. It may, it may be one of these assumptions of, um, you know, that is actually because of demographic shifts, just no longer accurate. Right. Yeah, so it's fascinating. People see Texas is so conservative. It has this reputation and this history in that regard. And in terms of its actual voting population and the people that they tend to elect, so yes, a lot of conservatives and the Democrats and progressives have had a very hard time at the statewide level. You know, Texas has extraordinarily low voter participation is what the challenge is. Even, even the white population does not turn out at a very large level in Texas. Yeah. And so you have a situation like Wendy Davis ran for governor in 2014. She lost by 900,000 votes. 2010, governor raised the uh, Democrats lost by 600,000 votes. There are 4 million eligible non-voting people of color in Texas, 3 million Latino alone. And so those numbers right there represent the complete transformation in terms of the potential of what Texas politics could be. And what's fascinating now is that even in this year's election, which I think some of it's the backlash and the resistance to um, uh, Trump, but even the presidential race this year is fairly close in Texas. So the polls showing a three, four point uh, difference and whatnot. Um, so voter turnout, in maximizing voter turnout of voters of color could flip and transform the state. So that's the one point about Texas. The other point, which I think is a lesson for the whole country, is that there's a lot of uh, potential and opportunity in uh, the progressive areas within what are seen as conservative states. And so statewide, yes, uh, we've not been able to win even the current electorate. But there, and the other, well, the, potent, the public policy opportunity is that these cities have large numbers of people. So uh, Houston, San Antonio, Dallas um, are areas that have large numbers of people. There are, you know, two plus million people in Houston alone. And Houston's elected, uh, uh, you know, white lesbian mayor um, for two or three terms who was then succeeded by an African-American mayor. And they're able to actually look at making some public policy reforms in terms of you know economic justice, um, et cetera, within that area. And so it's possible to look at that model, and you could say, okay, well Texas as a state, you're not going to be able to move the entire population yet until we do the political transformation. But you can move a public policy agenda in these more progressive municipal areas. So if you can pass something in. Houston and San Antonio and Dallas and a couple other cities, then you can actually reach many of the people in the state. And similarly in, in, in California, we can even be more progressive. You can pass with you know, Los Angeles, Oakland, San Francisco, San Jose, San Diego. That's like 15 million people in those areas. So if you can make a public policy change, you can start to effectively improve the lives of large numbers of people within those geographic areas without having to actually win statewide. Yeah, no, absolutely. <clears throat> One of my favorite chapter titles of any book I've read in the last year is Smart Ass, Too Many Smart Ass White Boys, um, which really is about following the money. And, you know, the money dictates a lot of what happens with the, our progressive strategies. Can you talk a little bit about what you saw when you started following the money? Yeah, so uh, uh, the title chapter is Fewer uh, Smart Ass White Boys. And uh, it's drawing from a line that Andy Young, who was one of Martin Luther King's lieutenants, said in 84, he became the mayor of Atlanta. And he was trying to get Walter Mondale's campaign to understand the importance of voter mobilization in the 84 presidential. And they wouldn't listen to our frustration. It's like, I'm trying to get them to understand, but they're just a bunch of smart ass white boys. They think they know everything. 
And so that's the challenge. And also, let me actually just uh, uh, mention as well in this context that this is what um, it's the people who control Democratic Party politics, which spends hundreds of millions of dollars really every year and a couple billion dollars in a presidential year who have a outdated and surprisingly um, evidence-free and non-data-driven approach to politics. And so this is the example I mentioned in terms of the Arizona and the Georgia campaigns. Those states are competitive this, this year. But the notion around how do you actually win them whether the best use of $2 million is to run television ads, and there's very little empirical data about the effectiveness of te television ads, and there's all kinds of data around the effectiveness of getting a voter to the polls. If you have African-American voters who are voting 90% Democratic, and you're running a Democratic campaign, every black person you get out is a vote for you, basically. Whereas if the white swing vote population at at best is going to be 50%, but historically Democrats have only gotten 40%. Mm -hmm. And so are you even going to be effective around getting that grouping to um, be able to, so the effectiveness of that dollar is not very um, uh, high, and it's not very supported by data and evidence, and yet so much of the money is spent, and the resistance and the, the uh, talk arrogance and ignorance, and ignorance, so there's not knowledge around how do you actually engage and effectively mobilize voters of color, and that's attached to a level of arrogance around, well, I don't know how these do these campaigns, and I've got all this computer firepower, and so they're not willing to actually hear or listen and understand better, and that's what the challenge is. So that is one of the big um, campaigns that I'm going to be engaged in right after this election. We're trying to connect up with national partners, and we're going to roll out a declaration that calling on the Democratic Party to prioritize investing its resources and gearing its strategy towards the new American majority. And then we're going to try to rally people around that and really try to insist that the people who get uh, appointed to be head of the DNC and, the, the, and the, the Senate committee and the Democratic Congressional Committee are people who come from this community, uh, who come from this mindset, as well as trying to make sure that there's a diversity of leadership in these positions. Because that's the other kind of dirty secret of democratic and even progressive politics is that 46% of Democratic voters, which is, I use as a proxy for progressives, are people of color. Yet the overwhelming amount of resources and money is controlled by whites. And so then if you take that and you add that to the level of arrogance around not wanting to understand or not, or thinking you know better when in fact you necessarily don't, but you don't even know what you don't know, that's a big problem. And it's going to be an even bigger problem for progressives after this election because I believe this, they're going to be a major, there'll be an internal war. It is a internal war it's on the Republican side and the conservative side. But one side of that war is going to be contested for people of color's vote. And Democrats are not used to making an argument around why they're better. They can just point to them and say, look how bad they are. But if someone like Marco Rubio is standing up and saying, I come from the immigrant experience. I know what people of color is like, and my views are better for people of color. Democrats have to make a stronger, better argument, and they're not equipped yet to do that. And if they do not shift the composition of their leadership and the priority of their agenda, they're going to be quite vulnerable going forward. So a lot of the people on the webinar, Steve, are you know activists of all different kinds, working on environmental issues, some on electoral issues. Um, that work that you're going to do post-election, is there a place where people can stay tuned or possibly engage in that issue. Um. Yeah, so we're going to be, um, uh, we have a online digital platform, the democracyincolor.com and the democracyincolor.org are integrated, and so the campaign will be run out of that, and it'll be run, so they can go to Democracy in Color and keep track of it. Um, and um, I believe there's a sign up there, and if, um, and if not, people can just re uh, reach me at uh, steve at stevephillips.com, and then we can plug you into that um, campaign. Great, great. And uh, we're going to turn to a couple of questions from the audience at this point, and our first question is from Scott S. Okay, great. Give me a second. I'm going to open up Scott's line here. All right, Scott, uh, let's see if we can hear you. Scott, can you hear us? 
Okay, I'm going to ask the question on your behalf. Sorry we couldn't pull you in. Uh, Scott's question is, do you have a view on the future prospects of the conservative party in regards to African American and Hispanics? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm laughing because I, it's a question that I've actually started to think more, a lot more about in the past few days. Is because that I've always, I mean, I have believed in, and I st still believe that the intensity and the ferocity of this election, as well as the significance of it, is that a lot, many of Trump's supporters feel uh, instinctively, and I would actually probably say correctly, that this is the last best chance to hold back the changes from the demographic revolution. And that in terms of this whole thing of make America great again, of getting back to the country they used to know and love, um, which just happened to you know, have women in the kitchen and blacks not able to vote. Um, mm -hmm. And so they, uh, but I always felt like, well, if this actually happens, then that's like the, the last stand. But now I'm actually wondering, well, is this going to be the last stand? And, and I also felt like because I don't believe that, I've never believed that Trump was actually in this election to try to get elected president, is that I think he always just wanted to become more famous, as actually a, we've quoted in an article saying that, um, you know, if he loses, he just goes back to being Trump, only bigger. And so he, so that's why he was able to win, is because he was not playing the game to win the general, where you can't be as um, extreme and racist and misogynistic as he is. But that works fine in the primary, right? And so he only really wanted to win the, you know, do well in the primary to promote his. So where does that energy go? That's one of the be one of the big questions. And who are going to be the leaders? In which the, which direction are they going to go? So it's clearly going to be a more, um, I don't know if I would call it moderate, but a, sec a sector which wants to connect with and explicitly try to be more respectful um, and engaging of voters of color. And we call it kind of the Marco Rubio. Um, and uh, Jeb Bush constellation, and that or, and or don't sleep on uh, George P. Bush, right? That um, Jeb's uh, half Mexican son, right? And then there's going to be the conservatives, which is more um, um, Ted Cruz in particular, which has been a little bit confusing to me because I always thought that uh, you know the uh, kind of the white nationalist part of the uh, their coalition was conservative. And so all these conservatives saying, this is not our party. Like, who, did, who did you think were actually your constituents and were voting for you all this time? So that'll be an interesting piece. But then there is this explicitly unapologetic white nationalist constituency. And where does that go? And what role is Trump going to play in terms of trying to organize it and lead it and consolidate it? Um, and is there somebody else who can actually come forward and try, and, and try to capture that, or is it just going to die off? I'm now thinking that it's not just going to die off as quickly as I thought it and hoped it might, but it's very unclear where it'll go. But I think that this level of internal civil war will continue for the next um, period of time for the Republicans. But on the Democratic side, there's no time for complacency because it is entirely possible that a Rubio could emerge. Um, from that battle as the standard bearer and as somebody who looks different um, than the, the Democratic leadership does. Yeah, so to a certain extent, because of inaction by the Democrats and progressives, things are up for grabs in a fairly dangerous way. You know, in reading your book, I mean, it was very heartening because the numbers, if we actually move in this direction, the numbers are so positive for a progressive majority to really start flexing its muscle. And as you know, in this current election, the idea of a progressive majority feels very far away. <clears throat> what do you see as the role of media and you know, how this election has proceeded uh, that leads the sense of you know, there's actually a lot of danger um, not that we're on the brink of victory, but we're on the brink of something possibly terrible. I mean, that's, that's, that's a, there's a sort of sense of foreboding with this election. Do you think the media has played a, a major role in creating that? Even if the numbers are on our side generally, it sure doesn't feel that way. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I would say that uh, particularly after in um, June, July, August, that that was a particular problem. 
Um, so at some level, uh, the media, you know, there are these quotes, things that, was it uh, maybe Les Moonves and CBS, somebody like that saying that, you know, this is terrible for democracy, but it's great for ratings in terms of Trump's campaign and all the attention he was bringing to it. Um, so at some level, they were drawn to it, almost even like a, whatever, a car wreck or whatnot. Um, so there's some level of that. I don't believe that is what created him. I believe that he has quantified the number of um, people who are driven by racial resentment in terms of their politics. And it's around 30 to 35% of the Republican base. And that's enough to win in a 17 candidate field. So I don't believe ultimately it was the media who did that. Um, and it's interesting, one of the lessons from this election to me is for all the talk of big money and uh, Citizens United and all of that, the real story of the election is you know, Bernie Sanders raised $200 million in average $28 contributions. Jeb Bush raised $100 million from big donors, and Trump on Twitter destroyed him. Right, mm -hmm. and so it really wasn't about the money or the resources in that same way. Um, he was just able to directly appeal to, and they never had a champion like him, an appeal to and draw out that constituency. The role of the media was then in uh, normalizing him and legitimizing this type of behavior. And so it's people that forget that when, right after he announced his uh, uh, campaign, he did the whole Mexicans are rapist piece, he was condemned and they were like Macy's was disassociating themselves from all these corporate actors were disassociating themselves from him. But the, 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 the half-life of that was very short. And so yeah. very quickly after, it's like, oh, well, that's old news. And I was like, well, how, what is the half-life of racism? Right? So, you know, somebody was explicitly saying they're going to do all this, uh, that they're uh, appealing to a, a racist campaign, but then we don't consistently treat them that way. And so what is going on where uh, NBC is inviting him to host Saturday Night Live? Uh, Jimmy Fallon's, you know, tossling his hair in this joking kind of a way. Mm -hmm. That takes away, that redefines him from being, this is the racist candidate who does not represent the values of the American people to, oh, is a fun guy, et cetera. So I think the media was very complicit in that. And that was my big fear. And I think that's actually why he almost caught up in the polls, is because he allowed to get normalized. Um, to then, you know, redefine who he actually is. Um, and so then the, the polls separated again. But there was definitely a very dangerous period in there where he was being treated just as a regular normal person, um, which was, uh, had a big impact on the standing of the race. Yeah, no, absolutely. And we have another uh, question first from Wit J and then Kanan T coming up. All right. Let's see if we can bring in Wit. Hey, Wit. Let's see if we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Great. Um, thank you very much, Steve. Uh, as you know, environmental groups are big players in elections and are spending upwards of a hundred million dollars per election cycle. Was curious to your reflections on um, how good a job we're doing at focusing on the new American majority, and what more we could do? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, so, uh, I'll say two things on that. One, so I actually wrote a piece uh, right on the Democracy in Color uh, um, website. I've been writing these analyses, and I think I actually wrote one. I do the monthly column for The Nation magazine, where I first said our, our voters of color are invisible. Uh, I said to African American, our African American voters are visible to the progressives and Democrats. So the first wave of uh, announced spending um, from the independent side of the super PACs as well as the environmental groups, uh, et cetera, there was actually very little any money for black voter mobilization, and which is the core key pillar just mathematically of the of winning democratic coalition. And um, and then I even the, the, and I've you know interacted with and I've raised this to. Uh, the folks at Next Gen Climate, and you know, Tom Steyer actually is a, is a friend of ours. But around pushing them around, are there, he wants to do a lot of work with millennials, but how do people even, what's the picture of a millennial in your head, right? I mean, almost the majority of millennials, or certainly people under 18, are people of color. But if you're just doing college campuses, and you're just doing college campuses in states 
that are not reflective of the diversity of the country, you're kind of structurally locking yourself out from engaging and reaching the new American majority. So having said, so I think that the start was slow and um, um, in the wrong direction, although it was some level of progress from 2014 where a lot of the money was just going in for television ads, and the point of these television ads is persuasion around um, voters of color, I mean, a uh, uh, persuasion of the, uh, of the uh, uh, white swing voter. But through the course of this campaign, certainly over the past couple months, I've seen more progress, right? And so, uh, uh, you know, Steyer and NextGen are actually putting $20 million into uh, a labor super PAC that is specifically focused on mobilizing voters of color. And so that's one of, that's, to me, that is putting one's money where one's mouth is. And so that's a very encouraging development in that direction. I started an organization called Power Pack that does voter mobilization of voters of color. We're working with the leaders from the NAACP who did a large mobilization in 2012. Sierra Club is moving some money into that effort to do voter mobilization work in North Carolina. So I think there's an increasing awareness of that, of the, the where, how that works and needs to take place, but it still needs to be accelerated. And so part of what I say and I give my talks is that what I mean by the new American majority, what I mean by brown is new white, the voters of color have to go from being an afterthought to the first thought. And it's true, so the environmental movement has a tremendous amount of resources. And I think a candid assessment would be that it's not had a tremendous amount of success with its policy agenda. But the numbers are there to change who it makes this policy. And so those resources could be married with the force that comes from the demographic revolution, hiring staff, people, investing in organizations, strengthening the capacity um, of, of institutions and organizations in the community of color. I keep saying, you know, as an example, why isn't there a, a civic engagement coordinator for almost every uh, faith institution that serves large number of people of color in the country? And so then you get get everybody, you know, get everyone's name. Are they registered? Are they on the list? Do they know what the voters are? So that's not an extraordinarily expensive proposition, but it's a way to up voter participation and a way to provide education around how these issues come together. And I think that's where I really like the example of SB 535 in California, the Polluter Pays Initiative, that that is a way for these movements to come together. And so for the environmental movement to make a tangible policy victory but to have the benefit of that victory, be able to move resources into these disadvantaged communities that actually need resources. And that kind of partnership, I think, is what will be necessary and what can really propel the environmental movement into being a bigger, longer-lasting player with real tangible policy wins. Great. Thanks, Steve. And Anne, I think we have Kane and T up next. Audience question? Yes. All right. Kanan, let's see if we can hear you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Thanks. So mine is a two-part question. I'm wondering if there is any chance of a third progressive party emerging, because there is, there is a certain suspicion that the Democratic Party is kind of in the center of the political spectrum and is corporate friendly, and for that reason may suffer from some conflict of interest once in power. The second question is, in, with respect to color, how do you see color, uh, people of color falling in the spectrum between the center and the far left? So I'll start with the second question. So I, I talk in the book about how um, that uh, my analysis is that people of color are actually inherently, not inherently, they are well, kind of inherently progressive because they face inequality and they face disparate treatment. And so one of the most central issues of the society is the level of inequality that, would, that exists within this country. There's a profound racial wealth gap. The average white family is 150,000 in assets, average black family 10,000, Latino around 11,000. Um, and even Asians who have come from, yeah, it's a little more complicated issue because 74 percent of Asian American adults are immigrants from a higher economic strata of their home country. 
But that's still 75, that's only 75,000 of the Asian, Asian American um, household net worth. And so it's half of what the whites are. So this economic inequality affects everything from the ability to have housing and quality education, or, you know, the living in a, in a healthy environment. Um, and so to the extent that communities of color are in that situation, and they're in that situation because of deliberate, historic, um, public policy and ongoing impl active implicit bias in terms of hiring and investing in, in different communities. So you have the situation, so communities of color want better conditions, they want, they want better opportunities for their kids, they want better schools, they want um, you know those different types of opportunities which are about equality. And so to get that and to move in that direction, you actually have to have more um, uh, public policy change. And so that is the definition to me of progressive. You have to have more progressive change. So I put communities of color on the left side of the political spectrum because they face inequality and are driving to change the society to bring about it and make it more equitable. In terms of the third party issue, I'm much, I'm not, I get the point around the Democratic Party does not represent um, the, the constituencies that it should and does not prioritize those communities. But I'm less pessimistic about the potential to change that. And so I'm much more interested in taking over and transforming the Democratic Party than I am in trying to create a third party. And that we don't have examples in this country of there being successful third parties overall. The structure of the, even the electorate, and the, even the legal system is that it's a two-party situation. But most significantly, I think we have the opportunity to take it over. 46% of Obama's voters for people of color. And so you take that plus the progressive whites as a in terms of the allies and partners, that should be the entity which takes over the party. So that's going to be a lot of the impetus behind this um, Marcy and Color Declaration that we're going to be launching um, right after the election in terms of and then the chair of the party is uh, an elected position. And so actually people could run or somebody could run for that around a platform it's a more progressive platform. Um, so I would rather us focus our energy and efforts around trying to take control of and hold accountable the Democratic Party. Their budget and their spendings are public documents. And so that's something that can be analyzed, downloaded from FEC or these different sites and Open Secrets and ProPublica. And then there's all the social media now where you can hold them accountable. We did an we did an audit of Democratic Party spending in 2014, but anybody could actually do that. And so the the accessibility and opportunity is there, and the moment is here. And so this there's going to be a transformation over the next few months of the leadership of the Democratic Party. So this creates a great opportunity for us to really weigh in to get the right people in positions of power, and the chairs, the executive directors, and the top staffing positions. And I think we can focus on that. And I do think that there'll be more of a um, uh, potential allies in that fight. There are, num there are some people in Clinton world who are social justice fighters, social justice advocates, who um, will likely have high level positions in a Clinton administration and the Democratic Party. So if we partner with them to bring up the others who can then transform the composition of the party and its direction and priorities. So Steve, a quick follow up on that, and this may be too optimistic. <clears throat> I'm wondering what your thoughts are. Like, is there any way that Trump and the misogyny and racism that he's really brought into the forefront in a way that hasn't happened in a long time in a, in a national election, could that be a strange blessing in disguise as far as motivating this block, this new progressive majority, to really start moving and take over the Democratic Party like you're saying? Is, the, is, is that a potential? I think there's potential for it. I mean, I think it's um, it's always a balance because when you have people who are have enough challenges facing their, you know, just you know, don't have enough transportation options and childcare and working multiple jobs that, and you're getting you know treated poorly at work, and you have to worry about the police. And you add on to that, then you've got this crazy pre presidential candidate. At some level, it can be galvanizing and motivating. At another level, it can kind of be more potentially dispiriting, actually. Mm -hmm. So that's a little bit of a balanced piece in that regard. Mm -hmm. But part of the work, too, I think, is that we have these movements that we have to, I think, try to connect with and both validate and draw in. 
So you have a Black Lives Matter movement, you've got an immigration reform and Dreamers movement. Can we channel and tie into those communities and those sectors? And then another sect, another realm of this, which I think is something that does seem to me to have marked a cultural turning of the corner, is around this uh, issue, uh, particularly around sexual assault. In that after that videotape came out, the number of women who have been speaking up and telling their stories and being empowered to actually, in talking about their experiences within the progressive movement, progressive organizations, has been startling to me as a man. And I've been, you know, I've learned a lot. And it's been notable that people who I have known for a long time and did not know they had these experiences are now speaking up and sharing them. So that suggests to me that something has changed in that regard. And so in terms of being able to deal with the empowerment and elevation of women within leadership, um, that I do have greater hope for. Yes, absolutely. We have another audience question. I think this is going to be our last audience question. Um, Gary C. is next. Ann? Ann, are you with us? Sorry, ha. Huh? Gary, are we able to hear you? Can you jump in? Gary C? Okay, I'm sorry we can't bring you in. I'll ask on your behalf. Okay, Gary's question is, in the discussion and search for answers to the racial issues Black Lives, Black Lives Matter is bringing to light, how do we avoid the historical trap of a white leadership majority telling minority communities what they need, what is best for them? How do we ensure the right voices are being heard and leading the way to real solutions? Yeah, you know, I think that that's one of the lessons and challenges we face is what does allyship look like, right? And so that's a question of like, how do we be supportive of efforts and, and community groupings and communities who are driving these types of concerns. So the Black Lives Matter movement has a very uh, politically sophisticated grouping of leaders who are giving a, have a long view around how do you build up power, how do you impact and interface with uh, public uh, uh, you know, positions of power and institutions. So a big part of, I think, of the work, you know, fundamentally, is the question around resources and how are we, and there's a question around accountability of those who move resources. So what are the foundations doing? What are the funders doing? What's actually happening in that regard? And so this, this allyship piece can be challenging, uh, holding accountable those who are in positions of authority and have positions over allocating resources. How are they partnering up with these movements? And so I think that's something that we have to both watch and hold accountable. For example, you know, both foundations, and a lot of the foundations talk about this, there's some different progressive donor networks around are they going to be moving their resources to these types of groups and being accountable to what they want to have. And then new, new entities, right? So Bernie Sanders' campaign is creating this group, Our Revolution. He obviously he has a large national donor network. How is he going to be moving resources in this regard? So that, I think, is one of the key things is challenging the organizations and institutions and leaders who have some uh, capacity to move resources is are they going to move them into organizations and respect the leadership of those organizations that are trying to advance these struggles. So a lot of ways I think that's one of the main um, uh, challenges and opportunities that we face is looking, you know, what does it show me the money, right? So we got to actually commit to investing in these movements in ways that is honorable and respectful um, and can help them achieve their goals. Great. So, Steve, is there anything that you, we're at the end of our questions, anything that we haven't covered that you really think is important for people to understand going forward? Well, I think I, think I would, I, people should, uh, don't sell yourself short in terms of what is possible in terms of holding accountable the larger institutions. And so I do think that for assessment of the third party and Democratic Party, there's a lot of cynicism about the Democratic Party in particular and, a lot, and some level of hopelessness about it. But it's a multifaceted entity, and we live in an era where there's a lot more uh, potential impact for an individual because of the technological tools that we have now. And so anybody can be a watchdog 
and you can be a watchdog by downloading data and analyzing data and uh, uh, doing report cards around your local Democratic Party or your local candidate. How do they spend their money and how does that align? And the, in, I, in chapter, uh, chapter 6 of my book, Invest Wisely, I try to offer questions um, that can be a guide. So anybody can ask these questions, people who have responsibility for running these campaigns. What is the, uh, what is the plan? Do you have a plan? How many, what's the composition of the electorate that you're trying to get you to 50% plus one? Does your budget match that plan? So there are some very specific pieces. And I guess what, I, I, what I'm trying to offer people is the confidence that we're right and that the numbers and the data and the evidence is on our side to then push those who are making decisions often without correct data um, to be more accountable. So the, the technological tools provide us the access to get that data and analyze it. And the technological revolution also provides us the ability to share the information. And so social media is a platform to be able to get the word out in ways that can hold entities accountable. Right? So now even then, you know, we see it like with in, in, in customer service and, 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 and corporations. So if you have a bad experience with an airline and then you tweet that out and tag the airline, they get right back to you often. So how can I help you? They don't want their name tarnished um, through social media. And so we have that opportunity and that potential to be able to use the tools to hold groups accountable and use the tools to spread the word around what is happening. And that is a way that the average person is more empowered now than we did we would have been 20, 30 years ago technologically. So I just want people to feel to own that power that we have the ability to make these changes and that to just encourage all of us that at this moment we are at an inflection point. We're gonna in the final months of the first black president in the history of this country, we are hopefully in the beginning period of both electing a, a, the first woman president, but in some ways this will be a transition period between what comes next for the party. There will be some few years of internal debate and struggle, which will be healthy. And so this is the time to engage this struggle and this battle, and I'm fairly optimistic and hopeful that we can make um, progress because the numbers are actually on our side if we apply ourselves and use all the tools that we have to maximize that. Yes, so in a certain sense, we are the ones we've been waiting for as the song goes. Exactly. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for your work over the last several decades. And the book, if you haven't read it yet, uh, is well worth picking up. Brown is the new white. Um, and for your next moves, democracyincolor.com is where we can keep up with what's next in this fight for the soul of the Democratic Party. Thanks so much, Steve. Great. Thank you, guys.